I just called to say I love you, Fred says from the other end of the line. And I smile and I say, sounds like a song to me. The veggie chili that I was stirring began to bubble and so I lowered the heat but I pressed the phone to my ear because I didn't want to miss a word of what he was saying. What are you wearing? He wants to know. And I smile again because, you know, it's the kind of thing Fred always says and no other man has ever asked those childish modeling questions that make me smile and stutter at the same time. A blue flowered skirt and yellow blouse, I tell him. And, of course, I feel foolish to the tips of my sandaled feet. Amy? Yes? I'm sorry. That's what he said. I'm sorry. And I couldn't trust my voice, so I sort of nodded, and I I just sort of prayed he understood, which he did. And then he said, Bye, sweetheart. So I hung up. And the chili was boiling, but I didn't see it because I saw Fred. And I didn't smell the scent of the scorched beans and onions filling my kitchen. I just smelled English heather. And I didn't hear the little hissy crackle from chili sticking to the bottom of the aluminum pot because all I could hear was, Bye, sweetheart. Oh, memories and images, you know, they flooded my mind just overriding the sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. Fred and I had shared the same agency for nearly two years, though we'd never spoken. In fact, I don't don't think I realized who he was for most of that time, because he didn't look like his voice, the voice that I and thousands of others knew by heart, because Fred was, hands down, the most popular radio personality in the area. He'd gone from being an afternoon disc jockey to an oldies but goodies midnight to 3 a.m. slot. And Fred's warm, mellow delivery, my gosh, it was perfect for the middle of the night. He was good company in slow-moving traffic, but he was even better on lonely nights when TV reruns were a bore and the silence was unbearable. I'd heard of stories about him, of course. I mean, everybody had. I'd heard about the homemade pies and the cakes left by love-struck housewives and about the the girl who had thrown herself nude across the hood of his car. His voice did that to people, well, to women. One day when I'd gone to the agency to meet a client, I was introduced to Fred, and I did my best to conceal my surprise. I mean, this was the voice the little man I had seen a hundred times in the hallway, the one with the thick lens glasses and thin, almost too sweet mouth. I hadn't visualized the Fred with receding brown hair or sloping shoulders, and yet when I got to know him, there was no other way he could have looked. His voice was his authority, his charm. The physique was actually unimportant. It was a mere encasement for the instrument. Fred could make the audience angry when he was angry, like once he said, the child molester got off with a slap on the wrist, and if you're as upset with the court's leniency as I am, write me and tell me how you feel, and I'll see that Judge Broderick Harmon gets your letters. My address here at the station is blah, blah, blah. He could actually make listeners angry, or he could make them happy if he was happy, and sad if he was sad. Mainly, though, between the love songs, he soothed. So Fred asked me out that first day we were introduced, not out on a date, but, you know, out for coffee to discuss the copy I'd be writing and his concept for a promotion we'd be creating for our client, a political candidate. So, at Millie's Coffee Clutch Cafe, I discovered a man with an intelligent wit and self-effacing sense of humor, and and somehow, and I, I don't recall the details of how it came about, but he began telling me about his separation from his wife of 18 years. And then, of course, I told him that I was one week away from being a divorcee. And I remember how that word stung 
I wanted to be divorced because of what my marriage had come to, but I didn't want to be a divorcee. Now that word just conjures up images of hard-looking women with dyed black hair and tight polyester pants sitting on bar stools, you know, throwing back the strong stuff. I don't know why, (laughs) but that's my mental image of a divorcee. (laughs) Anyway, I wrote the copy for the politician and Fred did the narrative and the client. He was delighted with the finished radio spot. And that made Fred and me so pleased with ourselves that we took us to Arnie's Bar and Grill, which is where I imagined I would end up anyway. I mean, right there on a bar stool since my divorce had been granted three days before. So anyway, we danced to Fred's favorite song. It's from the 70s. Remember Ray Price singing for the good times? We danced to that, and and then he took me home. Well, I assumed I'd see him again, you know, maybe at the agency. We'd pass one another in the hall, and we'd smile, and we'd connect, because we'd shared a week of hard work and long hours, and the result was a job really well done. It was our link. (laughs) What I didn't assume was that he'd call me two weeks later to wake me out of a sound sleep. Were you listening, he asked, and I knew he meant was I listening to him on the radio, and I confessed I was not. Too bad, he said. I played for the good times, for you. (laughs) For me? Because you danced to it so well. I grinned in the dark. And you thought I'd get up and dance if I heard it tonight on the air at three o'clock in the morning? He said, I thought you might put a pot of tea on the stove and wait for me at the front door. I actually thought about it. Tea at three in the morning. Hmm. Well, I didn't have any appointments until 10.30. And my fifth grade daughter, Brooke, was still away at summer camp. So I yawned and I wiggled my toes. And then I said, well, I was lying here craving tea when you called. (laughs) And he was still chuckling as I placed the receiver back in its cradle. Tea is very sweet at three, I learned. While the rest of the world was fast asleep beyond a fence of dreams, and the field across from my apartment was covered with the blue lid of pre-dawn mist, I listened to the voice murmuring gently through the shadows. My girlfriend, Barbara, was appalled. You act like a tramp, Amy, she said, with her delicate nose tilted toward the ceiling, and you'll be treated like a tramp. (laughs) Poor Barbara. She was definitely not a liberated woman. At 34, she'd recently returned to school to study for a career as an interior decorator. The reason she waited so late in life to pursue a degree was because there'd never been a real need before. Seven months previous, however, she found a suspicious letter and an out-of-town phone number in her husband Roger's suitcase. The woman who answered when Barbara called, she just readily admitted everything. She was not only having an affair with Roger, she stated indignantly, they'd been having an affair for four and a half years. Now, that put it at about the time Roger began working for the Heritage Paper Products as a, uh, what was he, he was a traveling sales rep. Anyway, Barbara said nothing to Roger. She just went out and she enrolled in school and she made her own quiet, determined plan. She'd get a degree and she'd become the interior decorator that she'd actually planned to become, you know, BR before Roger. She'd earn her own way and Roger be damned. Well, she filed for divorce two weeks later, and Roger didn't even know why until he read it in the petition. Anyway, she's talking about Fred now, and I protested because I said, I am not behaving like a tramp. Barbara laid her school books on my kitchen table, and she took a cup from the cupboard. And I told her, we're just friends. And besides that, He's going through a difficult time, Barb, with, with the separation and all, and and I understand how he feels. <laughs> Barbara was not impressed 
Yeah, Mother Earth, she sort of snickered at me. Her voice was 44 or 50 shades of snide. So understanding, she said, with one brow arched into her hairline. So she poured herself a cup of coffee while I thought about what she said. Mother Earth and understanding, you know, really weren't complimentary words, at least not the way she said them. But I smiled anyway, and I stirred my low-cal fake sugar into my cup. Do you know this man's reputation? Barbara persisted. And I said, Barbara, anybody who's in the public eye gets gossiped about. But if people really knew him, huh, a lot of people do, she interrupted significantly, taking a seat at the table. The truth, if Barbara only knew, was that a physical relationship Honestly, it held absolutely no interest for me right then. None. My libido was in hibernation. I'm not even sure if it ever worked right, you know. When I left my parents' home to marry my high school sweetheart, I did it in the same way millions of others before and after me have done it. That is, without a, without a thought. Nothing else, no other course for my life was ever discussed. I would graduate and I would marry Daryl. I would have Daryl's children. He and I would grow old together. And one day we'd die and we'd be buried side by side and end a report. Sex had nothing to do with it. You know, I used to wonder if I was put together right. Maybe something got left out in the making, you know, something essential. There were all those gothic novels and bodice-ripping romance writers. And finally... Sex therapists on the radio and on television talking about and writing volumes of books on the subject. Every one of them seemed giddy about puberty, a giddiness that extended well into senility, while I had never once experienced this all-consuming something that drove men to murder and women to ecstasy. Whatever it was... It must really be a doozy, I concluded. I was certain that if I'd ever experienced, you know, it wouldn't have slipped my mind. I was just sure I never had it. No, I never had. You know, a night of passion was like an evening emoting at the famous actor's studio in New York. I just acted my little heart out. Triumphantly, I thought. It was noble. It was necessary. And it made Daryl happy. And if all it made me was tired, well, that's okay, too. Because in truth, sex had nothing to do with our decision to divorce. Everything else under the marital sun, but uh, uh, not sex. His mother, his inability to get and keep a job, his temper, his immaturity. Oh boy, they figured heavily into it. Finally... I made the decision that if, if I was going to be the main breadwinner, I may as well do it without the grief of constant fighting, plus a hateful mother-in-law as well. And actually, divorce wasn't traumatic, not for me. It, it was for Brooke, who was you know, just 10, and she really needed a father. Well, my hope was that she'd come to understand that one happy parent was preferable to two miserable ones, that she'd know that she was loved by both parents, and, and now she just had two homes in which to leave her muddy shoes and to scatter her books, but that she was welcome and adored in both of those places. So my energy was spent on being a mother and in earning a living for us, and there was just really nothing left for the pursuit of it. So came as a distinct shock to find that after three or four non-dates, I, I don't think tea at three in the morning is really a date, is it? Anyway, after three or four non-dates with Fred, his first good night kiss turned me into all those things I'd read about since hiding true confessions inside my fourth grade textbook. I melted. I tingled. And I floated. And I was... 19. I was the 19 I'd never gotten around to being. Oh, and when I opened my eyes and I looked at Fred after that kiss, 
I no longer saw a frog, but a prince, and his sloping shoulders were wide enough for my head to rest on, and his eyes hidden behind those thick lens glasses saw inside me and found poetry. He had hair thick enough to accommodate my fingers as they stroked his brow, and three o'clock became, ah, a most enchanting hour on the face of the clock. You know, he even brought a blue bulb for my bedroom night light because he said he could see it from the main road, and it was like a star guiding him home. So now it's later, it's at night, and I'm listening to the radio, and he says, if your furnace is having problems on this oddly chilly September night, then toss another blanket on the old bed and get ready to cuddle up to someone very special. And I knew he was saying that to me because my furnace was on the fritz. He was telling me that he was coming over and that I could cuddle up to someone very, very special and be very, very warm indeed. Now, you know, not that Dr. Phil or what was that lady's name, the, the sex doctor? Not, not that they had any occasion yet to wave their victory banner. The libido's pretty slow to crank when it's gathered dust and rust for nearly 37 years. You know, cuddling with Fred, that was the closest I'd been to heaven on earth, though the other didn't leave me nearly so exhausted as it had throughout my marriage. I may not have glowed, but at least I was no longer counting holes in my acoustical ceiling. When he signed off his program as for the good times, I knew it was time to put on the pot of water, you know, on the stove, and to turn down the extra blanket, because that was our song, and I was his girl. That is absolutely the most disgusting, most juvenile thing I've ever heard from a woman of nearly 40, Barbara snorted. He's not even divorced. Well, he's separated, I reminded her. <laughs> yeah, separated, she smirked, like the wife's at home and he's here. Separated, Barb. His wife went to Indiana to her mama. She even took the kids. It's over. <laughs> Barbara shook her head and leveled a look at me, usually reserved for a psychiatrist and his patient. It's summer, she said. She probably went home with the kids to visit her mom. Well, it's my damn it life, I countered. And then I added one more damn it, you know, just for a little bit of emphasis there. But I really should have shown the girl more compassion. I mean, poor, bitter Barbara. I pitied her for never having had a Fred in her life. She had no idea what it was like to lie beside someone, scarcely breathing, touching their nose with your lips, and covering your mouth with a banquet before you clothed in the reflection of a thousand stars to find a baby frog on the kitchen counter captured under your morning cup of coffee along with a love note ah poor poor barbara and when i tried to tell her all those things boy her eyes only grew narrow and her ordinarily refined mouth drew itself into a tight little pink knot that spread out a single word crap well one morning, when I went downstairs to the kitchen, I found a sheet of radio stationery, and on it was handwritten, There are some very sweet colors to be seen in almost everything you paint. I don't even know if you like red or yellow or what. But the colors pursue me, and they tell me of your sweetness, and I like them very much. Wow, 19 was such a wonderful age. Fourteen three a.m.s later, Fred mentioned that he wasn't feeling well. What's the matter, I asked. I, I realized we really never talked about anything as trivial as health. We talked about the hour, the scent of the night, you know, important things. Bladder infection, he said. Oh, honey, what's the doctor say? Well, they gave me a shot of penicillin. I'll be fine. Oh, I was relieved. You should probably have one, too, he added. I couldn't imagine why I needed a shot of penicillin for his bladder. 
Well, you never know with infections, he said, concerned. Just to be on the safe side, I wish you would, honey. Then he smiled and left. And he didn't come back all that week. Good enough for you, Barbara trumped. <sighs> on the seventh night, I was listening to the radio as usual, and I was listening for our song, you know, the sign-off song. And he said, if you've got the top down on your convertible tonight, you'll see a big, red, beautiful moon, too beautiful to waste, too beautiful to be alone. What you need is to cuddle up to someone very, very special. Fred's smooth, velvety voice segued into Ray Price singing for the good times, and my heart sunk because I didn't have a convertible, but somebody did. And tonight the top would be down, and Fred and somebody would be driving along into that great, big, beautiful moon. Yep, I knew it. Well, it's Saturday now, and I have a doctor's appointment at 11.15. I'm cooking chili because tonight I'll meet Brooke in the uh, school parking lot, and she'll be tired from the long camp bus ride. She won't want to wait for dinner to cook. With the chili already prepared, you know, all I have to do is heat it, cut lettuce for a salad. Yeah, summer vacation is definitely over. So I'm stirring chili, and the phone rings, and it's Fred. He's calling from his car on his way to the airport. Mrs. Fred has decided to come home with the children. And that's when Fred said... Bye, sweetheart. Yep, I hear you, Barbara. <laughs> so now I'm glancing at the clock as I cover the chili, and I'm going to set it in the refrigerator. It's still too early to leave for the doctor's office, but that's okay. I've got to stop by the hardware store anyway. I need to buy a white bulb for the night light. You've been listening to Amy at 37, narrated by Esther Luttrell. The theme was composed and performed by David Randa of Fesleyan Studios.